Well, uh, thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, the organization, for the invitation, for the amazing invitation, the opportunity to be here. My name is Luis Naveda. I'm from, uh, well, since 2013, I uh, have a professorship position in music, uh, uh, in musicology at the State University of Minas Gerais, Brazil, a small uh, university in Brazil. Uh, I will talk uh, about variability in basically music and dance, m more about music, m more about dance uh, uh, and Afro-Brazilian uh, dance, basically. Uh, I will come from, 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 I'll try to go into insights that I, I got from mu movement sciences and then show some examples of my past research on Afro-Brazilian dance and music and maybe draw some possible impacts on the series of uh, written and meter. You feel that uh, while I, I talk, or I try to, try to draw my concepts, there is always this, uh, this shadow of uh, the theory of embodied mind, of embodiment. This is very difficult because sometimes we, we, I get lost into, into referring to musical meter in dance and music. So just, just understand that uh, I, I, sometimes I don't differentiate what is musical meter, what is dance meter, and I think it somewhat happens at the same time for the individuals. Uh, okay, uh, from, the, from the perspective of cognitive sciences, we can say that the variability describes di differences in observed behavior when an entity is placed in the exact same situation. You give a task to a musician to, or, or to a dancer, and this guy comes with many different ways to do the same thing. Uh, uh, from the uh, so I tried to, to, to go to the uh, human movement science to get some uh, some uh, perspectives for, for what they're doing there. So uh, the three main theories are the generalized motor theory uh, that basically says that you have a program and uh, you have to do this program that is in your mind and if you have some errors it's your fault and uh, it, this is uh, basically uh, um, variability. So it's your fault. Then you have this uncontrolled manifold hypothesis uh, that say that in order to make a task, you have different uh, mechanisms that support a single task, and the variability would come from the negotiation between these different uh, redundant mechanisms. Uh, and then you have dynamic systems um, where, where uh, what you have is an action perception feedback. You, you go through a, a kind of negotiation while you're trying to do a task. You, 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 you go interactive in negotiation between the constraints, biomechanical constraints, uh, environmental constraints, and you try to reach this task in a kind of self-organized way. So uh, these are the sources of variabilities from the perspective of uh, human movement sciences. But I, I do believe that we are not... Uh, uh, the, 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 the three graphs uh, were there or not? They were there, <laughs> sorry. I'm, okay, I will look to this. But, so, but I do believe that we are not in front of typical task-based uh, 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 approach. So what you have is, is a musical or a choreographical task that, uh, that it has intentional and creativity manipulation of variability. Musicians and dancers manipulate uh, variability in a creative way. So uh, the problem starts when we, we went to statistics, when we go to statistics and see that variability refers to measures of centrality around the mean, standard deviation, range, and variety. Of course, this is a, a very a superficial way to see variability, but, but this is how we, we start throwing uh, the baby together with the bath water. Uh, yeah, the early, earliest record in 16th century. I, I'm sorry, I'm a systematic musicologist. I have to say this kind of stuff. So, um, uh, what happens is uh, when, when you get into these uh, measures where the, the, the first perspective of, of measurement is, uh, is the central measures, you somewhat put the variability that can be important or not in the second place. So, if you if you look at these measures and, and you just throw the variability in the, this, uh, this spread, and, or you, you look at box plot and you, uh, and you see this mean, and the, the variability is there in the rest of, the, of these indications, and basically what you do is you hide the structure of variability, and that may be something important there. Moreover, there are some authors uh, that say that uh, if you apply traditional linear statistics methods 
on tasks involving, involving movement, basically what you do is you violate the assumption of randomness, which is to say uh, you cannot assume that um, that a, a, a subject is, uh, that does something that's not in the main, he is doing it because of random uh, sources. You may, you may violate the assumption of in, independence, which means that the, if you repeat the same task, you cannot assume that the, the, the second or third repetition is not related with the first. And this is what these guys in the mo human movement sciences are, are uh, raising, this question. So, um, uh, moreover, uh, may, it may hide the, the intentional uh, manipulation of creative variability. So uh, uh, what I would try to do from, from now on is to show how, how, how uh, insights could, can come from, from, if you look at the music and dance, at dance basically now, uh, from, by, by treating the, the variability in a different way. So just a, a brief uh, introduction to Afro-Brazilian Samba. It's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's referred to as having a, a two-beat uh, metrical, main metrical level. It's polyrhythm and polymetrical, and it's based on, on tonal st structures. Uh, the prototypical, uh, like the model of Samba, we can subsume it like, like that here. The first beat is muted, the second beat is is, uh, is uh, stressed in the mid frequencies, like in the in the bass, in the low frequencies. In the, this mid uh, spectrum, what you have is a mixture of different metrical levels and syncopation. And in the high frequency, you have this train of theta impulses that are normally placed at for a quarter uh, uh, beat. So uh, and um, oh, the typical uh, musicological approach, you have uh, many variable. May, you see variability even in the modeling of uh, what is the Brazilian rhythm. Uh, and this is samba no pé dance together with Brazilian samba. So you have the beat. These are uh, movement recordings uh, and uh, audio recordings I realized in Brazil in 2007, I think. Okay, uh, so, but uh, in the beginning of the PhD, I was not so um, wise and I <laughs> went to, I was trying to get a sense of repetition. What is this repetition? If I get this kind of data from uh, motion capture, where is the repetition? I came across uh, this fantastic work of Setaris, uh, Periodist Transforms, uh, that allows me to, to ask the, the signal, uh, uh, how, how can you, uh, uh, I ask the signal, uh, give me the, the possible periodicity in one period. If, if, the, if this period is not related with the periodist, it's, it responds maybe zero, maybe nothing. But if the signal, if it's related, it, re, it, re, it results in the basis of the signal. Instead of like, imposing a sinusoidal basis as FFT would do, uh, it, it re replies me, it gives me the basis, and I can calculate the, the, the relationship between uh, the basis and the energy norm. So I, I made a simple uh, idea. So if you can put signal, uh, ask a period, and you have a periodic basis and energy, I could do like that. I put dance. I extract something from music, from the music structure, and what I have is, is the movements related to, mu to, to the musical structures. What I did is I extracted uh, body uh, trajectories. I extracted the, the periods of the musical meter, and I asked, how, how are the periodicities? How, how, what do I get if I put the periodicities of the musical meter? What you have is a, is a collection of, uh, of repetitive uh, structures that uh, indicate what is being repeated uh, in the dance gesture uh, at each gesture, at, at each, uh, each uh, metrical level. So what you see here is that the, the magnitude of, of the gesture in the two beat and the four beat uh, um, uh, period, they, are, they have a, 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 the magnitude is, is much larger than the others, which means that the dancer could, could be repeating the, in, 
uh, in two bits or in four. This is a kind of ambiguity. It's not really variability, but it's a kind of ambiguity that, that is very interesting uh, from the point of from from the musicological point of view, but maybe not so so interesting from the engineering point of view. Uh, basically, we, ha we have to make a choice or just show this as a result. So why should we uh, think beforehand that there is a single uh, result if you are analyzing something? This is what I was asking, uh, looking at this map of gestures. So this more or less explains the matter. So I, I extract movements using motion capture or any other motion capture technology and then I have the trajectories I calculate the level of periodicity uh, well first I do some processing on the trajectories then I calculate the periodicity uh, in these uh, uh, trajectories and then I extract I select the peaks of the periodicities that are related with the musical meter. What you get is this curve. I have to make a selection, in this case two beats, and I can recompose it through the dance uh, morphology. The nice thing is you can also put the, the steps of the metrical level in this structure, this morphological structure. And of course recompose all the gestures, we call it basic gestures. Uh, in this case, for the two-bit level. Okay, what you can do with that, this is the result for 30 dancers, uh, and, and then it starts my, my, my problem. How can I do something with such a vari morphological variability? So what I try to do, uh, we'll try to be very brief because it's a little bit complex, I, I kind of developed a distance measurement between the full uh, gesture choreographies using Procrustes analysis. Procrustes analyzed the, the similarity between shapes. Uh, and then I have a confusion matrix, I can do multidimensional scaling, and from the multidimensional scaling, I can um, discriminate uh, uh, groups. Uh, if you, for example, uh, uh, try to discriminate the male and the female dancers, you get this uh, map, and you, have, you get nice things here. Imagine uh, here, you, with the male dancers, uh, I have a 50% of error, while the male, female dancers, I have 6%, which means that uh, the choreography of the male dancers for the two-bit level, it's, it's so, so uh, it, it has not a, a single model. They don't know what to do, in fact. While the female dancers, they have a more, more, uh, more uh, clear model, and this uh, somewhat matches with the, the machistic culture of samba. Well, the, the, the female dancer has this uh, performatic display uh, that and, and must fu uh, fu fulfill these expectations in the culture. So uh, these are the, the 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 individuals close to the main of the two groups, female dancer and male dancer. Here, variability takes uh, uh, characterizes the, the the male dancers, the male community of dancers, not uh, as a meme, but as a look. They they, they don't they don't get it. They, they, it's not the culture doesn't make these dancers, uh, the male dancers, as a main uh, uh, point. Okay, I'm not going to that because it's, it's not related to rhythm. So I have this basic gesture. But what I did, in, in, like lo looking for repetition, is uh, basically I made a simplification. I ignored the variability inside the gesture. What if I take the same features and I project the metrical cues uh, uh, onto, onto the, the, the space of the, of the gesture itself, of the dancers? I map the space of the dancer w with metrical cues. This is what I, I try to do uh, in this topological gesture analysis. I hijacked some concepts from topology. This is not topology, but I hijacked some, some concepts in order to, to build it and in order to compare this, uh, this qualification of the space according to musical structures. So what I have a project, uh, cues, I project them to spaces, I, I try to do some uh, discrimination, and then, then I reallocate uh, these elements here, for example, the, the blue is the first beat and the red is the second beat. Uh, this video explains the process.
So trajectory is again, and then I go there in, in the musical structure, and I extract, a, so I, I annotate some musical cues, and I simply project these musical cues onto the gesture space itself. So you can see that uh, sometimes these musical cues, they accumulate, they have less or, or more dispersion according to different metrical levels. And then you do some discrimination and you have this kind of map of the dance space. Okay, now imagine that if we can measure the dispersion of these element of these uh, metrical levels on um, projected on space, and if we can measure the recognition of this space. So how uh, how much of these points are concentrated in this region and can be discriminated there? Then we would have something like that. Here is the uh, is the for the 30 dancers. Here is the strength of representation. So how many points in, in comparison with the total points are there in that uh, regions? So you have more or less 60% uh, uh, of the points there. And then you have dispersion. This is, we say we, this could say that the metrical levels, yes, they are there representing uh, uh, musical musical levels in the dance. And then you have dispersion. That means that. Uh, some metrical levels are more dispersed than others. So the metrical level, the metrical cues, and now I'm talking about metrical cues, they, they have different distributions. So it means that uh, for the, in the dance space, the, me the metric levels, they don't have only hierarchies. They have fa the, the phase. It's, it's also different. So you have the phase. So the first beat is different. Uh, it's not the same level of the second beat. They have differences in the, in the dance space. Uh, for, starting from this point, uh, in this publication, I, I tried to, to support a kind of high, very weak hypothesis that these, the, all the abstractions that you see in these uh, models of meter uh, that are based on geometrical representations, metaphors of symmetry and abstractions, they could just... Uh, be based on what Kofi is, uh, uh, said sometime here, you should go, could just look at the dance. Uh, and I tried to support this hypothesis doing this kind of uh, analysis. So uh, I, I tried to put place dance as a kind of vestigial, uh, put, put musical meter as a kind of vestigial uh, structure that, that uh, kind of left over of a time where music and dance were together, musical meter would be a vestigial uh, structure that came from dance. This is a quite, I think it's weak for now, but it's quite interesting to, to think uh, musical meter as a, something that came from dance. Uh, so I will uh, go further, just to, uh, do some, um, uh, talk about my, uh, micro timing. That is something related with groove and something related to dance. So uh, in this work, uh, I had to, to go to, to this uh, musical analysis. Now I analyze commercial music and vocal percussions, uh, trying to see how how people differentiate. So how how uh, is uh, the characteristics of micro timing in uh, Brazilian music? Brazilians can do very well this kind of uh, vocal percussion. <laughs> So the results, uh, well, I tried to process these using uh, k-means uh, and then and this detection of, uh, uh, of uh, micro-timing, and the result is quite fascinating because uh, what you have uh, here is the, is the commercial music. You have this, uh, um, this, diff this anticipation of the third and fourth uh, on sets of semi quavers and you have the same thing happening in vocal percussion, even if, you, if I had 50% of non-musicians, which means that uh, even if they don't have the tools to, to express themselves as, a, as a musicians, they still express themselves as, a, as a groove makers. Uh, if you if you try to to extract it from the voice, so uh, it, it, this it's a very interesting data. I didn't go uh, uh, for now into the analysis of the variability because it, it's it, it has a, a, 
uh, I still have to, to, to see uh, the, the differences between uh, the micro timing across time, if it's different from the beginning and at the end of the, of the song. So just concluding, uh, rhythm variability might reflect a kind of optical complexity, a system that is not predict predictable and, and not cha chaotic, something in between can be underlying dynamic system, which means that it may uh, self-organize in, in, in the system of dance and music, can uh, also mean uh, redundant attempts to execute expression and keep metrical structure alive. More from the musicological point of view, variability may indicate participatory strategies. If you have variability, you have more chance so that people can participate. You don't have to be professional to, to, to participate in the, in, the, uh, in the context of music playing. You, you can hide idiosyncrasies. Uh, you can play with your personal or cultural idiosyncrasies if you have this level of, of variability. And you also can expose expertise. Uh, I have a good example, but I will not show here now. About the methods, uh, Stergiu and colleagues suggest to, to approach it, uh, tr trying to see how variability uh, uh, um, behaves across time series, or and using, of course, uh, nonlinear me methods, as uh, other uh, presenters uh, try to say here. And uh, I, I personally, I try to do a lot of data visualization, mapping, and interaction displays. And uh, I use it machine learning and clustering. I think it works quite well in exposing these nice structures of variability. Many thanks. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. Time for some questions. Anyone? Thanks. What a, what a wonderful talk and a wonderful approach you, you've got. Um, I've, I've got a lot of questions, um, but I think I'm going to just restrict myself to some of your conclusions. So um, I'm not familiar with the paper, paper you cited on optimal complexity, but it certainly looks to me like this trajectory, the main trajectory you were studying with the hand, looks like a chaotic limit cycle. Um, yeah, when you the, the main the main trajectory with the hand, um, a chaotic limit cycle. Yeah. No, when I was referring to this optimal complexity, I, I was uh, in fact it's a, it's a missing uh, slide. Uh, is there a view? Yeah, kind of looks like that one in the middle on the top, right? I mean, it doesn't have the two the figure eight shape. Yeah. But there are other chaotic limit cycles that look very much like the one yeah. that you're studying. Yeah, but uh, when I uh, make a conclusion part of the discussion, I refer to this theoretical model of uh, I see. you, where he says that uh, if you look at the, uh, the systems and you have predictability here and complexity here, you, uh, if you look at, for, for example, health uh, data, you see that uh, health systems, medical systems, they are not, not totally periodic. So it doesn't make any sense if you look at very uh, straight repetition mm -hmm. or periodicity. Right. Uh, the health systems they are somewhat here, where you have a lot of complexity, but you still have uh, predictability. Right. So this is what I was referring to. I didn't, uh, until now, I didn't approach it to dance movements using any sort of nonlinear methods. Uh -huh. uh, this is what I, I would like to, to, to do for now. In fact, all this issue about variability is what happens when I finish my PhD, I look at my data, oh my god, I don't have any meaningful results, like I don't have a significant, I, uh, I don't even have a T student test. <laughs> <laughs> I only have this bunch of data visualization, machine learning techniques and so on. And I was uh, uh, questioning myself, oh, I'm doing everything wrong, or I'm just in front of a very interesting data that shows lot of variability. Yeah, no, I think the latter. Yeah. yeah I think yeah, some of those statistical techniques get overused and people yeah. don't interpret those kind of results. Um, but it, it also looks like um, in terms of nonlinear techniques, you know, if you now use a state space embedding technique to try and recover um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the different um, coordinates of that movement, I mean, I think you um, might have something really interesting. I mean, you already have something. You are in the June, so we could do something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that would be interesting. <laughs>
I'll leave it there. I'll hold this up for the break. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. More questions? Yeah, I just, I just have a comment. I mean, I want to echo Ed's, Ed's uh, comment that it's a, it's a great topic. We're really interesting to see what you're doing. I, I think the thing that you, you did that really struck me as the most innovative was you've got these essentially two disparate data sets. You've got the music and you've got the dance data. And what you did was you found techniques to use one of those, I guess the musical one, to structure the way you display the data in the second, and, and display and analyze the data in the second set. And that's really innovative. I, I, I mean, I, I don't know about other work that does this, and, and I think irrespective of the individual techniques you use to do those things, it's, it's the way you've related the two data sets. And it's such a natural fit here. I mean, of course, Thank you. Dance but this, is not, uh, this, is, this, is, this is already placed in the, the, the Afro-Brazilian mythology. If you look at the Afro-Brazilian mythology, the guys are saying this, this thing. Uh, like every, every myth related with dance or with music says something about dance. You just have to read the, the mythology and, and it's there. What I'm doing here is just repeating, at, uh, let's say, in the engineering side, the concepts that are uh, uh, packaged into mythology. It's like that, it's simple. It's not simple. An innovation doesn't come from, from, from just that. that. It's just that. <laughs> <laughs> I put it there. It's a, for example, there is a myth uh, that uh, you have uh, the, the shoe. A shoe is a, is a Brazilian deity that is, makes confusion. It's often, uh, mixed, uh, it's often interpreted in the Western world as being the devil. But it goes there and, and makes a lot of confusion. and. So there is a myth that says that uh, the dance has to come into music in order to kick off a shoe. So it, it's basically this ambiguity, way, this rhythmical uh, ambiguity that, that you see in the, in the musical structure. So it becomes the dance with these two beat patterns, a repetition and so on. So it disambiguates the, the rhythmical ambiguity that is, is in the music. And, and uh, who says that? Actually, uh, thank you very much. This is a wonderful presentation. And what you just said in the last two minutes is partly answering my question. Because I was wondering whether there is any dance ethnography about samba that could help to elucidate the cultural life. And some of the things you said about the male and female roles, uh -huh. I wondered whether there is some other kind of study about we're using other techniques to describe these roles. If they're really roles, or if you think they're just random. Yeah, yeah. From the cultural studies, mostly doing observation, but not using data. What you were just saying about mythology is not using data, but it's actually very helpful. Yeah, yeah. Of course, both. I think it started uh, based on the context. It's based on this uh, cosmology that mm -hmm. is kind of written. Yeah, I'm just saying that for those of us who are not Brazilian, it would be useful to refer to yeah, some of this material. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. We have to keep moving. Thank you.